This is going to be another of what I refer to as those magical history tour episodes, which are becoming quite popular. I'm getting a lot of comments. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. What I do is I pick a year and I talk about the cultural, political, historical events and the music that came out in that year and how they all impacted each other. And this year, it's 1966. And what a year that was. The most popular band in the world stopped touring. And their rivals decided to release their first live album, which really was kind of a fake. And the band that I was in, we called ourselves The Darkness, we just kept a rockin'. So you're ready to go back to 1966? Okay, let's drop the needle. Nineteen sixty six starts out the year with a faded kind of has been Hollywood actor announcing he's running as a candidate for the governor of California. <laughs> right. And then also the National Organization of Women is founded. In March the Rolling Stones release Big Hits, subtitled High Tide in Green Grass. Interestingly enough, this album was released in the UK and it would be nine months later until it came out in the US. And of course, the UK and the US versions are different. Also in the UK, an unknown singer decides to change his name. His name is David Robert Hayward Jones. But he changes his name to David Bowie. And on British TV, The Frost Report premieres introducing the world to John Cleese. Meanwhile in Hollywood, the movie A Man for All Seasons wins the Best Picture Oscar. And that seminal California group, The Beach Boys, release only one album in 1966. <laughs> but what an album! Pet Sound. Pet Sounds allows us to see the genius of Brian Wilson in full bloom. The album was not very well received in the US. But boy, it was an instant hit in the UK. Classic songs include Wouldn't It Be Nice, Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, the single Sloop John B, I Just Wasn't Made for These Times, and two tremendously great songs. One of my favorites, Caroline No, and the song that Paul McCartney claims is the best song ever written, which is God Only Knows. And Paul has said that the release of Pet Sounds spurred the Beatles to try to top it. And boy, did they ever. A couple of interesting things happened in the press in that spring. In an interview with the London Evening Standard, John Lennon talks to Maureen Cleave. And he has a line where he says, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus. And no one in the UK has any reaction to this. But a little bit later, a teen mag here in the US called Datebook releases that quote from the interview and chaos erupts. Radio stations throughout the South stage protests, ban the Beatles, bring your records in, burn the Beatles. No one can be more popular than Jesus. It seems like the Fab Four have fallen. And in April, Time Magazine's cover says, Is God Dead? Around that same time, the Bad Boys of Rock, the Rolling Stones, release Aftermath, which is their first album of all original material. And interestingly, they add a bunch of totally different instruments to enlarge the sound of the Rolling Stones. Great songs are Painted Black, Lady Jane, under my thumb, out of time, and I am waiting. And towards Christmas, the Rolling Stones release their first live album. It's called Got Live If You Want It, and it's not a good album. Their performances are lackluster, the audio recording is abysmal, and in fact, it's not really all live. Two particular songs Fortune Teller and I've Been Loving You Too Long are studio takes where they overdubbed Screaming Kids to make you think it's live. <laughs> the Rolling Stones have later disowned this album, 
and say that the album that came out much later, Get Your Yaya's Out, was their first live album. But Got Live If You Want It came out in 1966. When summer came along in 1966, my band, The Darkness, was busy. We were playing gigs every week. Here's a picture of us at the time. Notice our outfits. We took inspiration from two of our favorite groups. Look at the white pants and the high leather boots. That was from Paul Revere and the Raiders, who were big in 1966. And then the military jackets, well, they're modeled after what the Beatles wore, their performance at Shea Stadium. Now, we looked cool, and we sounded good, too. But the problem with those jackets is they were made of heavy material. And when we played for three hours plus under lights in a gymnasium full of a whole bunch of kids, they were hot. Speaking of Paul Revere and the Raiders, they had three albums they released in 1966. Just Like Us, Midnight Ride, and The Spirit of 67. In June, one of rock and roll's first double albums comes out and stuns the world with its creativity and its audacity. And it's by the Mothers of Invention, and it's called Freak Out. But in 1966, double albums are definitely becoming a thing. In July, Bob Dylan releases his double album, Blonde on Blonde, and it is the only album that he'll release in 1966. Well, out in Las Vegas, in 1966, on August the 5th, Caesars Palace Casino and Resort opens its doors for the very first time. And three days later, the Beatles released that great album, Revolver. Now, August was a busy month for the Beatles. They embarked on another tour. This was a tour of the U.S. And on August 11th, they were in Chicago and held a press conference where John Lennon apologized for making the statement that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. He made the comment it wasn't supposed to be some sort of anti-religious thing. The apology was kind of lukewarm received. But the very next day, on August the 12th, the Beatles played a show at the International Amphitheater in Chicago. And of course, I was there. And if you want to know more about those concerts, check out episode one, the de debuts, where I talk about the Beatles and talk about my experiences in going to two of their concerts. And then, on August 29th, the Beatles perform at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. No one really knew it at the time, but it was the last concert and public performance that the Beatles would ever play live until, of course, many years later on their rooftop during the filming of Get Back and Let It Be. It's a big year in television. On the small screen, for the very first time, we hear... Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Yes, Star Trek premieres September 8, 1966. Also in September, a new television show premieres with four zany musicians. Modeled after the Beatles in A Hard Day's Night, the Monkees premiere. Now we get to November, and a couple of big things happen in November. The first is, you remember that has-been movie actor who said he was going to try to run to be governor of California? He gets elected. Welcome Governor Ronald Reagan. And the creative genius Walt Disney dies. And on November 24th at Abbey Road Studios in London, the Beatles get together to begin work on an album that Paul said, we have to do better than the Beach Boys did with Pet Sounds. So on that day, they begin crafting the masterpiece, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Like all the years from the early 60s through the middle 70s, 1966 was a pivotal year for music and cultural events. There was a lot of great music that came out in 1966, and I've only touched on a few of the artists. That means 
that it bodes really well for what's going to happen in the next year in 1967. But while we wait for that episode, listen to the music from 1966 and keep a rockin'. If you like this episode, hit the like button and you can also leave me a comment down below and I'll respond to you. If you subscribe, we'll let you know when future episodes come out.